Okay, welcome on into another episode of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. I am Colin Sonelia, along with my co-host, Jamie Hoffman. If you have a minute and feel inclined before we get going today, this is a leadership podcast. And if you love leadership, you might want to consider helping us by placing a review on Apple Podcasts that helps us find other leaders and it helps other leaders find us. Uh, So please consider doing that if you have a moment. Today's Featured conversation is with Caroline Fitzgerald, and we will get to that here in just a minute. But before that, Jamie and I have a few things that we want to talk about. We're going to start like we do always with some big wins and then get into a conversation that relates to the featured conversation. So, Jamie, I'm going to start with my big win for this week, and it is my upcoming trip, my first trip to Las Vegas, Nevada. I am super pumped to go. It's going to be a super busy trip and a super quick trip, uh, basically like two full days um, because I'm taking a late flight out of Charlotte and then I'm taking a red eye from Vegas back to Charlotte on Saturday morning. Um, And uh, so it'll definitely be quick, definitely be jam packed, but there's a lot of free time built into (laughs) what we're doing for work over the next couple of days there and have an opportunity to explore, meet a lot of my coworkers and things like that. And like I said, first time in Vegas, I might even try to get to a hockey game Friday night because I think the hockey team's in town. Uh, So depending on how I'm feeling before I fly out, I might try to do that. But overall, definitely excited for the trip and looking forward to my first Vegas experience. That sounds like a ton of fun, especially when you have the excuse to go for work, but you also get to enjoy it and make a little bit of a vacation out of it too. So yeah, for sure. Very exciting. (laughs) My win of the week is I'm going to count it as a win. It's more of like a goal, I guess, but I discovered that I have a ton of unused credits on class pass and I've always been someone who's very active and works out and used to think the world would end if I win you know, more than two days a week without working out. But since starting puppy preparatory, I have had zero time to work out and I actually not worked out in months besides, you know, dog walks. Um, But I realized that those credits can get me so many classes in comparison to like what a class was in New York city and how many credits it took to Charlotte. So um, I've got a lot of unused classes. So it's really motivated me to sign up for some workout classes. So I'm going to count that as a huge win, just forcing myself to set aside some time for myself and actually work out, which I think will help mentally too. just feel a little bit more grounded. So I'm really excited about that. Absolutely. That's so cool that like the credits transfer and that they even like change in terms of the cost of living, I guess is the best way to put it (laughs) so that you can, like you said, take advantage of it now that you're in Charlotte, a lower cost of living than it is living in New York. And uh, I would imagine though that, uh, I mean, it didn't seem like you were making a big deal about your dog walks and and everything, but just in terms of all that, I am sure you get some workouts every (laughs) single day with the dogs that in some ways can replace some of these classes that people do. For sure. If I look at my step count on an average, you know, week, it's pretty high. So, you know, it's better than nothing. Absolutely. (laughs) What do you think off the top of your head? I'm just super curious now. What do you think is like daily your average step numbers? Um, I looked up, I looked it up today because I was just really curious. I think for the last month, I averaged like 12,000 steps a day without like really trying. So um, that is, you know, it's better than nothing. It's good. It's (laughs) the dogs are, you know, helping me stay active and fit. So I'll, I'll take it, but I do think adding some extra workouts will be nice set aside some time for just myself too. So sure. Sure. I mean, there's something definitely to be said about getting that good sweat in and kind of the endorphins and the good feelings that come from that. It's a little bit different than I think, as you've alluded to just walking or playing with the dogs all day and it it adds up for sure. Like, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's, it's definitely a different feeling. So I'm happy for you. I'm glad you're going to get back on track there and uh, you'll be uh, arm wrestling me and beating me and all that stuff soon. So (laughs) my nickname all through high school and middle school is Jamie Buffman because my last name is Huffman. So (laughs) There we go. I'll get back. I'll get back into Buffman shape in no time. Wow. I had days. no idea, Jamie. You just taught me something new here on the podcast. Breaking news for everyone that's listening. That is
is that is amazing. I never <laughs> even put that together. I just I I don't know. I that's uh, wow, wow. All right, well, <laughs> that's it. That's the podcast. It's all over. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. We'll uh, we'll get into. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what parallels to this conversation with Caroline Fitzgerald that will release to everyone here in just a few minutes. And Caroline is the CEO of a company called Goals. And uh, a lot of the work that she does is really, um, you know, including a podcast that she has is, is getting the word out about the business case for women. Uh, and, and in her industry, that's primarily sports, specifically sports for the most part. Um, but, you know, I think the business case for women in general is, is something that uh, can be set across the board is taking shape in a way that it hasn't in this country or even you know, across the world in the history of mankind. And so I wanted to talk to you, Jamie, you know, being a female business owner. And I'm just curious, kind of like what your experiences have been like, um, you know, a lot of what Caroline talked about and what she does is just kind of like changing the narrative, but it's not just like you go on social media and you change the narrative. Like, you know, people, women particularly are proving themselves in an industry like sports, for example, where like traditionally it's been so male dominated for years and years and years. And there's still a lot of males in that industry that look at females and they're like, what are you doing here? Like, have we'll, we'll start there. Have you ever gotten that like treatment from anyone, males, females, like, you know, cause you're, you're younger, like I am too. So maybe it's even an age thing where, you know, someone older is like, oh, you should, you shouldn't have your own company. Like, have you gotten any resistance from people or like, what are you doing here? Like you're out of your league. I certainly have not so much with puppy preparatory. I think that is a little bit easier for people to conceptualize me as a dog trainer and running that. But when I was still in New York city and working on the previous company that I was working to launch before COVID hit, which was a dog food company. I faced that all the time. And it was a lot about age as well as being a female, but I experienced it in so many different ways from meeting with manufacturers, speaking to manufacturers, trying to negotiate rates on things like packaging and, you know, kind of navigating my way through the logistics and the industry. It was honestly pretty tough. I started working on positive impacts when I was around 22. So I was wow. really, really young. And I remember going into a meeting I met, I flew out and met with a really big manufacturer at one point when I was originally going with dry food, long, well, cut out, you know, long story short was started with dry food, then transitioned into working more towards raw diet. But, um, I met with a manufacturer, huge manufacturer out in Utah, and you could just see the look on everyone's face as I entered the meeting room and then through discussing it. And I think they realized as I sat down and we were talking about everything that I was more knowledgeable and more serious about it than they would have anticipated, which was nice. So I think kind of by the end, I gained some of their respect, but it was, it's tough, right? Cause it's nerve wracking going into any, you know, business setting where you're, you are talking about rates and you're asking these really important questions because it really is going to impact the success of your own business. And they are kind of looking at you very clearly, like, what is she doing here? Like, how could she possibly do this? So it is, it is, anxiety inducing in a way, or, you know, it's just a little discouraging. And I even had it too. I was looking at warehouse spaces in New York at the time. Once I did decide to do raw, I needed spaces that could hold freezers. Uh, Cause there's a lot of logistics involved in doing nationwide shipping for frozen meat essentially. So I was talking to people renting out these warehouse spaces and again, it was like two men showing me around and it was the same kind of look of like, what are we doing? We're totally wasting our time talking to this girl what is going on. Um, and it, it didn't bother me that much. I think as a woman in business, especially depending on the industry, you kind of know to expect that. And that's a sad truth. I think there is an, a lot of, you know, encouragement on social media and what you read nowadays. And there is this really strong women empowerment movement, which I think makes it a lot easier, but it doesn't really change the day-to-day -day interactions quite yet, depending on the industry you're in. So I've certainly experienced it I think we've still got a long ways to go on making it a really nice, warm, welcoming environment for women, especially in the entrepreneurial space. And I think, you know, that really goes back to women in sports too. I think they face the exact same 
thing. They're just not taken as seriously. And there is a different kind of mentality on a woman who's in sports and trying to make that, especially when you're trying to make it your career. Um, it is a little bit challenging, but in some ways on a more positive note, I do think they're just based on where we are in society right now. It's in some ways, it really is kind of an advantage to be a woman. And it's exciting. And a lot of people are embracing women owned businesses. So once you get to the yeah. point where your you know, doors are open, and you're actually selling a product, I think it may be harder on the back end when you're trying to, you know, make business deals and make connections in the industry to build up to the point of launch. But I think once you launch, from my experience, and kind of seeing the community of women led businesses, or how people are now, because there's such a light on that topic, people are so willing to support a female led business, at least in my experience. So I do think while there are some negatives and there's a long way to go, I think there is also this positive of like, wow, things are really shifting and they are changing. And I think the consumers are more willing and accepting of female owned businesses than they were in the past. And that can be used to your advantage. And the more we have people kind of fight past the maybe inconvenience or the discouragement of people looking at you funny when you're trying to start something or not taking you seriously, the more people who get past that and get to launch and prove that, you know, women can do it too, you know, the more the back end will, it'll catch up and people will take you seriously when you walk into those business meetings on the front end. Um, but I think from a consumer side there, I mean, it's been really encouraging. So there's positives with the negatives. <laughs> sure. Sure. And I appreciate you sharing that with me and I've, Quick follow-up question, and then we'll get to Caroline's conversation. One of the things that I love about you is you you tend to be like me in the sense that, so obviously I'm going to like you because you're like me, but <laughs> <laughs> um, you tend to do things without asking for permission per se. Um, like you're not waiting for somebody to tell you that you can start a company at 22 or even after, you know, that company didn't work out. I'm not even going to say it's, it's, it was a failure, but it didn't work out. It, nobody, you're not asking someone for permission to say, Hey, I want to start my own puppy training company. And so there's a lot of confidence that you have built up over the course of your lifetime through a number of different experiences, I'm sure. And what I'm curious is, you know, you talked about how once you kind of showcase the knowledge and everything, like then the, the conversation starts to turn a little bit, like whether it comes to in conversation with mail or just an executive who's like, what the heck is this kid you know, doing here? Um, is it as simple as that? Like you get your confidence from being as knowledgeable as you can be on your particular topic or are there other things that you attribute to some of that confidence that's helped you in some of these conversations where it's been really difficult, but you've been able to kind of find a way to, to get through it and to even persevere. I do think kind of seeing where people are at the start of the conversation versus the finish has kind of helped build confidence, but that's certainly not the only thing I know for myself growing up, I was so, so, so shy. And so when I was like, I want to go to New York and do acting, I didn't really tell many people. I decided I was going to graduate early my sophomore year of high school. I didn't tell a soul until I graduated early my senior year, but like my family knew. Um, but everyone, once they found out was like shocked because I was like the most quiet, awkward, shy kid. So, but I love to act. And so I think going through acting school, even though I loved it, it was so outside of my comfort zone. And I think that gave me a lot of confidence because you're going into auditions or you're constantly getting rejected. So for me, I was like, all right, this is just like another audition. Like people go in, they look at you, they're judging you. It's a little bit different when you know you're in business versus you're like, well, it's a lot of superficial or it's whatever, but in acting, it's your talent. So it's tough. But I mean, to make that kind of relatable for anyone, even if you're not in acting or the arts and had to get over that, I think like even doing public speaking can really help because it builds confidence. And if you're going to get, you know, tongue twisted, which I still do, obviously, but um, I think just having kind of like practice rounds of like, okay, here's how I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about it or just pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. That way, when you do go into that meeting and a big executive or whatever is looking at you kind of funny and you can read the look on their face is like, what, we're not going to take this person seriously. You can go, Oh, but like I've practiced it. So the nerves aren't going to get the best of you. And I think having that extra sense of like, Nope, I feel comfortable speaking kind of helps you push through when you're even more nervous based on the reactions of the people in the room. Sure. Great advice. Great advice. And 
I think I've learned more about you, Jamie, in this one podcast than I have in the what two years that we've known each other now or a year and a half or whatever it's been. So <laughs> this has been an awesome podcast for me. And I appreciate you sharing all that insight because I know it's a challenge to do things on your own in general in life. And, um, you know, when the odds are kind of stacked against you um, from a systematic, um, you know, standpoint and everything, it can make it even more tough, even more draining. But, uh, you know, as we've highlighted a number of times on this podcast, I mean, I think you are a really good role model for, you know, people who want to do some really cool and fun things um, in the entrepreneurial world. So definitely listeners, if you haven't already, go check out Jamie's information. It's on the show notes. Go check it out. Definitely give her a follow on Instagram. And with that, we are going to transition here to my conversation with Caroline Fitzgerald, again, CEO of Goals. This is an awesome conversation, a lot more into the business of women's sports. So enjoy that. And Jamie and I will see you next time. Okay, everyone, welcome on into the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, my guest with me is Caroline Fitzgerald. She is the founder of Goals Women's Sports Extraordinaire among many other things as well that we'll get into, I'm sure, in this conversation today. But Caroline, I'd love to start today's conversation. Let's give a little context to our listeners. Talk about your background a little bit. How heavy was it in sports growing up? How did you get to you know, where you are today as a very influential social media person? And uh, we could t- certainly talk more about goals and stuff later on, too. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Colin, thank you so much for having me. Uh, what you've built uh, with your your platform in this podcast is awesome. And it's an honor to be considered a dynamic leader. So <laughs> thanks again for having me. Um, yeah, my background. So it's been a journey. I, I love to say like I have this very linear path that it's like, oh, I've been working towards this moment of working in women's sports my whole life. But it's been kind of a winding road, which I think is like most people's career paths. Sure. Um, but I have to like shout it all the way back to the beginning, like my first moment, like my first feminist moment in sport. So I grew up in a family of eight kids in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So six girls and two boys. So there's a lot of girl power (laughs) at my house. Yeah. Big family. Um, and we, I, my parents love sports. So we've joked that my dad loves baseball so much. They had eight kids because they were really going for nine so they could field a baseball team, but like we're, we could just do with eight. So, um, life, my parents, lifelong baseball fans. Um, so when time came to sign me and my younger brother up for youth sports, my dad really wanted me to play baseball, but there wasn't a girls baseball league. So he just said, okay, well, I'm just going to sign you up and you and your brother are going to play in the boys league together. You're just going to join his team. Sure. So I, I joined that team. I think I'm six years old. My brother's five. So we're so young that it's like pitcher. It's not T-ball. It's a step up from T-ball. So the, yeah. the parents are pitching. So we show up to our first game. We're on the Reds. And the other team was mocking us and they're like, oh, we're going to kill this team because they have a girl on their team. And I was like, are you kidding me with this? So, and I'm so little, six years old. So we go out <laughs> into the field for the first inning and I was playing pitcher's helper. So because the parents are pitching, they put someone next to the mound to field any balls that come to the area of the pitcher. Sure. So I'm playing pitcher's helper and the first three boys on that team hit ground balls to me. And I scooped them all up and I threw all of them out. And I remember walking off the field, Colin, with such a swagger. Like, how dare you boys think that you were going to beat us because I'm a girl and I'm on this team and I just threw all of you out. And it was like my first like feminist empowerment moment in sports. And I feel like it's just like a key moment because that was like a light switch for me or like I I was just like a light bulb went off. and. Um, from there it was like, yes, I'm not going to be told that I can't do something because I'm a girl because I'm a girl and kind of went from there. So that's like, (laughs) that's the beginning. That's my first, um, entry into kind of the women's sports world or being a woman entering the sports world. Um, but then from there, so I call it, I played basketball my whole life. That was my core sport. So I'm not very tall. I'm a five, five point guard. Um, so I had the choice to go play division three basketball or play 
varsity club basketball D1. Um, so I went to Penn State and played club basketball there, loved it, studied marketing and women and gender studies while I was there. And then when I graduated, I went into marketing and retail space. So I worked for Kohl's department stores for a few years from Kohl's, went to um, the Smithsonian Museum in Pittsburgh and worked in marketing and events there. And all this time, so this is about maybe five, six years, you know, once you're in sports and you like are an athlete and you love sports, you're kind of just like waiting for that moment to get back to it. Yeah. And then that moment popped up for me uh, with the Dick Sporting Goods Pittsburgh Marathon. And I had an opportunity to go uh, work for the team at P3R, which is the, the organization that puts that on uh, as the head of partnerships and sponsorship sales. And it was my first time doing sponsorship sales. I didn't really see myself as a salesperson, but what I found really quickly that sponsorship sales are really just like building a marketing plan for a brand to get exposure through whatever they're sponsoring. So I found a lot of success in it, loved it, ended up doing that for five years. Um, and then eventually, so uh, the pandemic hit, so I guess I should say that. So the pandemic hit and I was still able to work the whole time with the marathon. We had virtual programming, but I think during the pandemic, everybody comes like a little, came a little obsessed with something different. Like people were baking banana bread. Some people <laughs> like got pets. I know I got a cat that I'm obsessed with now. Um, <laughs> but I became really, really fascinated with the business side of women's sports. And it all kind of started around the 2020 WNBA bubble season the, in the wobble. Um, and I was just like, so moved by that season and what the players of the WNBA not only accomplished on the court, but more so what that's, what they use the season for. So they use it as a platform to advocate for racial and social justice. And they just, it was so powerful. And um, I was just really moved by it. So right around that time, I had the idea to start um, goals. And really the, the first idea was to start a podcast like you. So the business case for women's sports is our podcast because I wanted to listen to a podcast about the business of women's sports and I couldn't find one. So I was like, well, I'm going to start it. Um, and then from there, um, it's, that was about, yeah, August of 2020. So uh, about 14 months later, um, goals is now a has pivoted a lot along the way in those 14 months, but now we're a women's sports sponsorship consultancy. So leveraging my background in sponsorship sales um, with the, the marathon um, to now hopefully bring some more investment into women's sports. Such so a, that's it. Long story long. <laughs> such a great journey. And I could totally relate to the pivoting with your business. I've done a lot of that with my business before we pivoted to mainly focus on supporting women in sports. And um, a six, six-year-old Caroline sounds like a badass. So that was, that was a great story. Definitely <laughs> appreciate you sharing that with me. And I actually want to stick with that general topic because uh, it's reminding me of something that I wrestle with quite often. So I have a one-year-old daughter uh, and um, I am also a huge baseball person. And there is a significant part of me that wants Stella so badly to love baseball in the way that I do. But there is also a part of me that understands that a just in the baseball world, there is a very comparable sport in softball and B there's a lot of other great women's sports out there that from an exposure standpoint, and we can talk more about this in, in detail later. It's not where we want it to be, but it's certainly better than it was when I was a kid growing up in the nineties. And she'll have that opportunity to watch the WNBA, to watch the national women's soccer league, et cetera. Um, so I guess what I wrestle with here is I, I just think about these scenarios when she gets older, where what if she loves women's sports, loves herself as, as a female, you know, and everything. Um, but she decides she wants to play baseball. Like she wants to, you know, be one of those people that kind of breaks ground and sees how far she can get with it. Like, I don't even know how to, have a conversation with her around that, like the difficulties, the challenges, the, you know, the, their snarkiness when you're six years old, I can't even imagine, you know, as you get older and you keep trying to do it and pursue it and, and everything. Um, and, and so, and the reason I wrestle with it 
and I, I apologize for going on a tangent, but I, I seriously have thought about this a lot. I don't know that it would be wrong for me to say like, okay, if you love baseball and you want to play baseball, then go play baseball just because you're a woman, you know, doesn't mean that you need to play like the traditional women's sports. And like, I, I hear you all the time and I see you all the time on social media saying like sports shouldn't be inherently male. Like, you know, the, the W attached to the NBA and, you know, et cetera. Um, so I don't know if there's really an answer to this, but I do wonder like, you know, what, what are the conversations we should be telling young women about, you know, what, how, I mean, should, should she love the same things that I do? And, and I'm growing to, to love women's sports more and get more involved in things like that. But it wasn't something that I was involved with when I was a kid. Um, or do I, you know, just kind of put her on track to be supportive of, of women's sports kind of more exclusively and say like, men's sports have had their time. Like go, <laughs> go do that. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I'm wrestling with. <laughs> no, it definitely makes sense. And I, it's so funny. Yeah. Cause I think about like my parents probably wrestled with the same kind of conundrum, if you will, 25 years ago or whenever that was, how old am I? My goodness. Um, <laughs> whenever they put me in the league. Um, no, I, I mean, I think one really exciting thing right now is there's more we're not where we need to be as far as opportunities for women and girls in sports, but there's significantly more than there were 25 years ago. when I was that little girl in that baseball league, um, title nine has been around for 49 years coming up on the 50th anniversary. But, you know, I think when you're looking at specifically like baseball versus softball, there's on the baseball side, there's amazing organizations and brands and people out there that are working to make baseball a more inclusive space, specifically for women. Um, the organization Baseball for All with Justine Siegel, like doing some amazing work to get women and keep women in baseball. Um, but then on the softball side of things, I think softball has come such a long way in the last, like I, there wasn't a softball league for girls of my age back at that time, but now there are, it's much more commonplace. And I think softball is a really, really exciting trend that honestly, I don't, if I was in the shoe, if I was back to being a kid, I think I'd prefer to go into the softball space right now versus sure. baseball, just seeing how things are trending. So like the major MLB is seeing like a 37 year like viewership and attendance drop, like the lowest attendance and viewership they've had in like 37 years. But on the softball side, we're seeing like record breaking viewership attendance numbers, like around the women's college world series and around things like athletes unlimited, um, and their pro softball league. So there's all these opportunities now that weren't there before. And there's this, I'm starting to hear some rumblings, at least on Twitter, who knows, take it as you will. Um, but about how softball is just such an engaging and even maybe more exciting games because it's a faster paced game. So people are really enjoying the softball viewing experience versus the traditional baseball experience. So, you know, that's a roundabout way. I'm not sure what you should tell Stella. Stella is your daughter's name. Yeah. So, um, but hopefully we get to a point or we're at a point where, you know, there, those opportunities are all at least there so that like Stella can try all these things. And then she, if she prefers baseball and wants to like be a trailblazer in that space, um, she can go for it. Maybe there'll be more girls on her team and she wouldn't just be the sure, only sure. one. Um, or the softball is a really exciting, exciting time and an exciting game. So hopefully there's just more opportunities. So the conversations won't have to be as challenging because at least you have some choices. Yeah. I don't know. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, no, I think choices is a really good way to, you know, put the cherry on top with all of this. Is, I mean, that's a lot of these, I think, questions that maybe young parents like myself are, or parents who have young kids are maybe wrestling with, will just get figured out a little bit more naturally than they used to be in the past where you just, you didn't have the choice to watch women's sports, for example. Um, and, and now you do. And so it's like, okay, well, let's give you that choice, whether you're a little girl, a little boy, whatever, let's give you this, the choice to choose just like we would with anything else. Um, you know, if you're, at least from a parenting perspective, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but <laughs> yeah. And even like, there's more, 
opportunities like since the like pro option is there in a bigger way now. So I'm really excited about the athletes unlimited model, which is um, for anybody who's not familiar with it. It's this new kind of like fantasy inspired individual team model of professional sports. That's really a startup focused on women's sports and they started a softball league. So they do these like kind of round robin tournaments um, where they bring all the best softball players in the world, in the country together, and they compete again in this kind of fantasy style point scoring play. So there's this like whole professional league now that like women who play softball at every level can look to and be like, okay, there is an opportunity for me to play professional. I know there's been other professional softball, um, women's fast pitch, things that are out there, but there's more opportunities now. So I think it's a really important thing for girls to know, like, okay, there is, um, there is a, a path for me, like yeah. to that highest spot when that hasn't necessarily been as clear in the past what that is. So I think that's a really important piece of this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Something interesting that you also brought up was title nine. And I don't think we need to get too much into defining that because it's been around a while. And if people don't know about that, it's ignorance at this point more than anything else. But, um, what I, what I really find interesting when you brought up that comment is um, through one of my conversations on my podcast, I had an individual talk about like, okay, so the, the purpose of Title IX is what it is to you know, start bringing some equality to the, the genders when it comes to sporting um, within like institutions like schools and things like that. Um, but what it did not address and what is still kind of prevalent um, in some cases is the disparities and the differences between, let's say like a baseball clubhouse at a college and a softball clubhouse at a college. And so often it goes on and on and it continues to be like that because nobody speaks up, nobody says anything about it. And I think you're starting to see, especially with social media, picking heat up on this, you're starting to see more and more people, men, women, whatever, speak up about these type of things. But I think that was like ultimately one of the most impactful things that anyone has ever said to me on this podcast about how I myself, without being like a lawmaker or policymaker or anything like that, can really help advance women in sports specifically is just by if you see like a significant difference in the quality of a male sport versus a female sport, say something to whoever, say something to the admin, the AD, say something to the newspaper, the local newspaper, uh, make it a story, make it known uh, versus just being like, well, that's just how it is. And, and everything like, have you, um, I guess so. I'm bringing this up to, you know, is that something that you've come across? Like, is that something that you actively do? You try to, you know, point those things out when you see them versus just hoping somebody else will, or, uh, you know, it'll just change magically on its own. Yeah. I mean, yes. And I think that's a really special thing about the women's sports community in general. Is it at least in this day and age? And I think historically for a long time, we've seen this over more than 50 years ago, this is something that women in the sports world have always been. They've always been kind of inherently activists and not afraid to speak truth to power. Um, I mean, in this past year, I feel like we saw one of the greatest examples of that in recent history with the NCAA March Madness tournament and this disparities between the men's um, playing experience and the women's playing experience. And Sedona Prince, who was a player for Oregon got on TikTok and created a video and showed everybody the difference between the women's weight room, which is like a yoga mat and a stack of dumbbells versus the men's weight room, which is a state of the art fitness facility. Um, and then it just kind of went on from there, but social media, um, as you said, Colin has really unlocked this ability for the women's sports community to even speak more truth to power, to hold the powers that be accountable. Right. Um, it's this whole platform now that wasn't there before. Or we might've had platforms, but they weren't as far reaching. So Sedona, Sedona Prince's TikTok video, it got like, a cri I don't even know, like millions and millions of impressions and views, yeah. like truly. And so it, 
again, it gives us this opportunity to have like greater distribution of this activism. So at goals, yeah, we try to do things like that as well, because, you know, I feel like some of these things just keep rolling forward. And if nobody speaks up and says, this isn't okay, then it's just going to keep rolling. I, and I'll give you an example last year. Um, I Googled just cause I'm a huge WNBA fan. As I said earlier, I Googled, um, something of what is the WNBA? It was something so simple like that. I can't remember the last thing, but the responses on Google were like, why is the WNBA so bad? Why can't we like all of them were like pretty, um, pretty problematic articles that popped up as the first search results on Google. And a lot of those articles were not credible articles. They were like Reddit posts or blog. So it wasn't the algorithm didn't seem to be functioning as it should be on Google. So, um, that's something goals pointed out in, in like a very like matter of fact, just like, this is what happened kind of way went to Twitter. Twitter's an amazing place and said, Hey Google, can you just help us out with this? Because, um, when you search the WNBA, it actually brings up some false information about the WNBA. Can we just maybe redirect it to bring us to the WNBA website or whatever. And Google actually responded and the head of search got back and they made those changes. So, um, it, it it helps to speak out and, you know, that's a success story. It doesn't always happen, but what's really special about the women's sports community is everybody tends to come together around these collective goal around this collective goal of making the sports world a better place for all people, not just women. Um, so there's strength in numbers and that social media piece is really important that we now have this tool to get more, um, support and more collective power behind um, changing some of those inequities. Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about um, opportunities, choice. I'd love to pivot and talk more about the business case. I I know that's something that you closely monitor, not just in your podcast, but for the organization overall. And personally, I'm sure it's, it just uh, is something that is always front of mind. I have my uh, invest in women uh, t-shirt on right now. I had a, Last night I was recording for my other podcast uh, with uh, Hannah Lichtenstein, who's a former guest on this podcast. Um, and we were talking about the W, we were talking about National Women's Soccer League. So, um, and then I knew I was recording with you today and uh, I got this shirt from Kelsey Trainer, another um, former podcast guest of the show. Um, and it's just, uh, it seems so clear and obvious that it's almost like there shouldn't have to be a case for women's sports. Um, but you know, here, here we are. And, uh, you know, we, we have, we definitely have to convince some people. Um, I, I was, uh, having a conversation with Hannah, a separate conversation I'll, and then I'll shut up and let you talk. And we were trying to figure out like, where are we as a society on this? And, um, a, a few weeks ago, uh, Melanie Newman and Jessica Mendoza, did a nationally televised uh, baseball game on ESPN becoming the first like color and um, play by play duo um, all women, you know, booth in, in the history of the network and maybe even of major networks. And all you have to do is take one look at that tweet and take a look at the replies from males to see where we are at it as a society. And it's not good. It's not pretty. Um, and that, and that doesn't, you know, that, that's separate, I guess, from like, uh, you know, talking about these women's leagues, uh, which we've been predominantly talking about. But I think we're also talking about women having opportunities in sports in general, whether it's broadcasting or coaching, um, you know, front office executives and everything. So where can we, I guess, start? Where are your focuses when it comes to that case for um, women's sports? Like, where do you tend to focus the majority of your time on? Yeah, absolutely. So first I got to shout out Kelsey trainer, love your shirt, love how she has really helped shape the vernacular around and shift the vernacular about investing in women athletes and women's sports versus betting on them. Cause it's not a bet. It's a solid business investment. Kelsey, actually, I got a double shout out Kelsey. Kelsey tweeted something that actually inspired the whole business case for women's sports podcast. So she tweeted I want to say last July, she said it's bad business not to be in the women's sports business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, it is. (laughs) 
I was like, and on the flip side of that, that means it's good business to be in the business of women's sports. And that really like set me off from there to think, okay, we got to continue to make this business case for women's sports. So Kelsey's amazing. Um, but yeah, as far as the business case for women's sports and where we at goals focus. So as I said, my experience is in sponsorship and brand sales. So I did that though, um, in the running space. So the Dick's Sporting Goods Pittsburgh Marathon were a major marathon, a huge race. Um, but when a brand comes to town to sponsor sports, when you're looking at a running event, they usually look at men's sports first. So if they were, if a brand is coming into town and they want to sponsor a sporting entity in Pittsburgh, they're going to look at the Steelers, the Pirates, the Penguins. Running is a running race is probably not on the first thing that they think of. So there, I think there's a lot of similarities there to women's sports where like the first thought is like men's sports. And then we think of other things. So what I saw, um, it, in the running space was the power and how much more we were able to do for our runners and for our organization and for the community when we had great partners and great sponsors. So because we were able to bring on Dick Sporting Goods and FedEx and Bank of America and all these wonderful partners, we were able to put on one of the best in class races in the world, in my humble opinion. So for me, it feels like the same thing in the women's sports space. So if we're able to bring on more partners, more brand investment directly into women's sports, it's just going to open up a lot more opportunities. So at goals, we focus on the brand and sponsorship piece of things. Um, and that's because I think there's probably the greatest amount of opportunity there. There's a stat that women's sports receive less than 1% of global sponsorship dollars in the global sponsorship industry. It's like in the billions and women are getting absolute crumbs. So there's a ton of money out there and women are getting essentially none of it. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. And then there's been a few key pieces of research that have come out in the past year that really, really, they indisputably make the business case for why brands should invest in women's sports. So one of them is um, this first uh, piece of research. It was put out by True North Research Group, and they determined that sponsors of women's sports actually had better outcomes than sponsors of men's sports. And that was for two main reasons. One, because like any investment, it it's a lower investment. So if you want to sponsor a women's sports team versus a men's sports team in the same space or sport, you're going to probably pay significantly less to spend sponsor the women to be like the top sponsor over there than the men. So it's a lower cost. That's just the state of the, the market and the industry right now. But more so is women's sports fans are so loyal and are so willing to support and spend money with brands that sponsor women's sports. That there's some real power there. So it's between the low, the low spend and then the high return that comes because of these dedicated sports fans. It's like a no brainer for brands to come along. So that was one piece of research. And then the fan project um, which is a report that was done by Sports Innovation Lab, Angela Ruggiero, um, who's a revolutionary leader in women's sports. She was, a, I believe, a four-time Olympian for Team USA in hockey. She has this um, sports research company, and they really dug into that piece of the power of the women's sports fan. That's why it's called the Fan Project. And they analyzed 10 million data points to understand women's sports fan behaviors. And they doubled down on that finding around the power of women's sports fans and found that there is just so much business potential with investing with women's sports because women's sports fans are again, just like so loyal and so ready to reward the brands that invest in the teams that they love. They, they have all these case studies, um, uh, around brands that have invested in NWSL, the WNBA, and they're able to track fan behavior before and how they felt about these brands before they sponsored women's sports leagues and teams. And then after, and it's off the charts. Like the moment that a brand signed on to work with women's sports, women's sports fans immediately started spending more money with these brands, 
But even more than that is that they would spend money and then they would go to social media and be like, hi, I bought Budweiser because they sponsored the National Women's Soccer League. So it's like the gift that keeps on giving. So it's just, those are just two examples of why it's good business to invest from a sponsorship perspective. But then there's all these other examples where we have all these case studies of how viewership numbers are off the charts. We're breaking records pretty much every single time that women's sports are on TV or given a platform to be accessible to sports fans. Um, And then every time there's a merchandise drop, it's like everything sells out right away. There's so much demand. We see examples every single day of the demand for women's sports. Um, And so we just really need the supply to catch up. So the goals, we're just, we think that we can help tackle that sponsorship piece of thing that less than 1% of sponsorship dollars. And that's where we are really going after it to try to move the needle in that regard. Um, to piggyback off of the work specifically that, that you can do, or the, maybe, maybe the question is the people that you can help, um, you know, if there's potential investors listening to this podcast, or thing, I mean, like what, what are, uh, can you give us like a, a little bit more specifics or direction into like, um, what we should be looking in or like how, if we were to come to have a conversation with you and your company, like what, what type of things should we be aware of? And, um, you know, just, uh, I guess, give us the spark notes of, <laughs> uh, of the rundown there. <laughs> yeah. So goals. So we, how we work with our, um, company. So we're a consultancy and we like to work with women's sports organizations that don't necessarily have an in-house person to sell sponsorships or partnerships for their organization or their team. So the state of women's sports is a lot of organizations don't have front offices like men's sports have, they don't have a full-time person dedicated to this. And my thing is if you don't have someone who's dedicated to selling, how are you going to do it? Because there's probably somebody there doing a thousand other things, being the GM and doing the marketing. Like if somebody's not dedicated to bringing money in, that money's not going to come in. So that's where we um, hope to solve that problem. So some of our clients so far, so we're working with uh, three teams in the uh, premier hockey federation, which is previously the national women's hockey league. Um, that's one of the leagues that just rebranded to remove the W because they're like, sports are not inherently male. We, the NHL doesn't put M at the top of the (laughs) men's national hockey league. Why do we need to do that? So working with them, working with a few other organizations as well, again, just trying to dedicate time to bringing um, those dollars in because they're out there. There's a lot of really wonderful companies that are interested in supporting women athletes and not just supporting them because the right thing to do, like supporting them because it's a good, good business for their brand. So that's what we do is if there's a women's sports organization that would like some support and help and somebody just kind of like going out there and selling and having these conversations with brands, um, we're here to do that. That's so great. And, um, definitely encourage people actually, this is a nice segue to, uh, where, where can we find more information about goals? Where can we find you on social media? Yes. So goals, I mean, the women's sports community is so social driven as I talked about a couple of times. So we are on all of the socials. So Twitter is, uh, a place you can find us Instagram, LinkedIn as well. Um, uh, the business case for women's sports, our podcast is available pretty much everywhere that you can listen to podcasts. Um, most of our listeners listen through Spotify, we found. Um, so we're there. We also, our website is goals-sports.com. So we're in all the places. I would say to connect with us, we're most um, most active on Twitter because that seems to be like a kind of the organizing, the core point where the women's sports get, community comes together. So we love to be in that space. Yeah, very strong, very engaging space for sure. Um, you know, good, good dialogue. It's not like, uh, my Yankee Twitter where, uh, you know, it's just like uh, crap after crap tweet that, that you see there's, there's at least some context to the women's sports. Um, even, even if there is disagreements and, you know, people who aren't necessarily on the same page with everything. So I will get all that information into the show notes, Caroline. And, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time today. I know we could spend a lot more time. Uh, maybe we'll do that in the future, talk, talking about the business case and how we can get more involved, but I really appreciate you coming on, uh, sharing your story and uh, giving us all your expertise as well. 
Colin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you again for creating this platform. It's amazing. And um, I'm hoping that we can do some good work so Stella can have all the opportunities in the world, in, in the sports industry, sports world and beyond. So thanks for all you're doing. 